Hello, my friends. You're watching Origins, and it's a delight to have you with us. My name's Don Chapman. It's my privilege to be your host. Origins is a forum that uses the evidence of science to validate the truth of creation. Our guest today is a very special man. For 34 years, he was a professor of anatomy at Washington University in St. Louis in their School of Medicine. He's trained. How many doctors do you think you trained, Dr. Menton? <laughs> A few thousand. <laughs> a few thousand doctors. Yeah, we had 120 uh, a year for about uh, 40 years, that's 34 years. That's tremendous, and uh, what a gift uh, you've already given to our society. You have a special gift for us today. We're going to talk about the breath of life. Uh, that, I assume that has to do with our lungs. Is that right? Yes, the lungs and breathing. You know, what a, what a great uh, blessing the Lord has given us just to be able to breathe. If you couldn't take that next breath, what would you pay for it? I don't think there's anything in the world we probably take for granted on an average day more than, than breath itself, but without it, nothing else is worth anything, is it? Absolutely. You see, we, uh, we use food, and when we use food, we, we burn it up, just the way your fireplace might use logs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we call that oxidation, when logs burn. And as you know, the log won't burn unless it gets oxygen, unless it gets air. You have to have a draft for the fire. And so we cannot take food that we eat and use that food for energy and to build our body parts and what have you, unless we have oxygen, just like an automobile or, or a fireplace. And that oxygen comes in through our nose into the lungs and it goes out into the blood. And that's really what we'll be talking about. Well, you've got a lot to teach us about how we breathe and uh, we're anxious to learn. Well, there it is. This is a nasal cavity. The air is just going to go right in there. But you know, if you live in Minnesota, as I did for a while, and you get into the winter, it gets to be 10 below zero, it actually sort of hurts to breathe at 10, 20 below zero. Because yeah, that cold air is going to go into your warm body. And the Lord's aware of the problem. <laughs> okay. So inside of our nasal cavity, he gave us a radiator. A radiator and a humidifier. For example, on your furnace, you might have one of those devices where to keep the air from being too dry in the wintertime, it humidifies the air. Well, on the lateral wall of our nasal cavity, we have a couple of little ledges that stick out, and there are blood vessels inside those ledges, and uh, the blood vessels give off heat to pre-warm the air before it goes into the lung, as much as possible. In Minnesota, it can be difficult to catch up and also to humidify the air so we don't get too dry a air going into our lungs. So little radiators right oh, yeah. along the side uh, of the wall there serve to heat and humidify the air. When the air uh, has entered into our nasal cavity, it comes down into an area called the pharynx and into the larynx, which is where we speak. And uh, we're going to use that air to speak, too, because without air, we can't speak. That's what causes our vocal cords to wiggle. And there's a kind of a little fork in the road down here. If the air goes this way, it goes into the trachea, and uh, we are able then to uh, get that air to our lungs. And then there's another path this way where the food goes. And, of course, we want to make sure we get the food down the esophagus and the air down the windpipe, it's not too comfortable, you get those mixed up. From there we uh, go down the esophagus to the lungs. Now the lungs are interesting structures. We see one on the left and on the right. We have a lung on the right, one on the left. And those lungs are inside of a sac. Uh, and the heart is also in a sac. We'll talk about that later. For now we'll talk about the lungs. And that sac around the lungs is important because the lungs are going to be like a bellows. They're going to get larger and smaller that will allow us to breathe. The problem is if the lungs are moving and they're inside this sac, rubbing that sac could cause friction. So there's a lubricant lining the sac so the lungs do not give off too much heat. Our heart and our lungs alone would overheat our body to the point that we would die. Huh. were it not for the fact that they are in lubricated sacs to minimize the friction. It's amazing. Uh, to get air to come into the lungs from the esophagus, we need to change the size of the chamber that the lung is in. We need to make it a little bigger. And that is accomplished in part by our ribs. The ribs 
uh, you'll notice kind of droop down. We're looking at the body from the back and the ribs don't come straight out like this. The ribs rather come down at an angle here, down at an angle here, so right. down like that, this. Huh? And then if you were to stand alongside the body, they also slope to the front. Now I've brought along a really expensive prop to show people here I've got <laughs> exactly how this works. You can see we've spared no cost. Uh, if this is the body right here, the bucket, this handle would be like our ribs. Notice it slopes down here and also slopes to the front. When we breathe, we have muscles attached to our ribs that elevate the ribs. And notice what happens when the rib goes up, like the bucket handle here, a space develops between the bucket and the handle. And that space is what pulls air in. Okay. So we're increasing the space laterally and front uh, to back. Well, there's more to it than that. Across the bottom of the lungs is a muscle called the diaphragm. It's like a dome. And when we breathe, this diaphragm goes down, and that pulls air into our lungs as well. So the elevation of the ribs and the movement of the diaphragm. Now, this is the trachea coming down here. Uh, we sometimes call it the windpipe. And the trachea branches into the two bronchi that go into each of the lungs. And there, like a tree, it branches more and more and more. We call this the respiratory tree. One of the problems is we get dust and dirt that we inhale. You know, you have to have an air filter on your furnace. You have to have an air filter on your automobile to get the dust and dirt out of the air. Well, you can imagine how much dust and dirt we are inhaling. And uh, what are we going to do with it? We have to have a way to catch it. And it's not enough to catch it. You have to get rid of it when you catch it. And uh, that's just one of the most remarkable things that you could even think about because all this dust coming into these airways gets trapped in a kind of a gooey substance lining the respiratory tree called mucus. I always kid people that one of my favorite subjects to talk about is mucus. <laughs> and the <laughs> dust gets caught in the mucus. Well, that works. Uh, you, you've got dust trapped, but now the mucus is down inside the lungs. And uh, not only mucus, but dirty mucus. How are you going to get it out? Well, there has to be a constant flow of mucus up the respiratory tree. Sort of like the Everglades, you know, a shallow river that just constantly flows. Huh. And all of the trapped dust has to come up to what we call the oropharynx, where we have a choice. We can either swallow or, to use a technical word, expectorate to get rid of it. And uh, <laughs> so uh, how do we get this mucus to flow uphill, yeah, it has up to the respiratory uphill. tree? Uh, that's such a wonderful story. I should charge you all $25 a piece to even explain this to you. Uh, this is the lining of the trachea right here in the bronchi. In other words, the main tube and then the fork. And you'll notice that its surface is covered with what looks like fuzz or a hair. Now, these little fibers up here are much smaller than a hair. They're called cilia. They're so tiny you need a very powerful microscope to even see them. And they don't just stand there like hair and not move. They move like a whip. They beat. In fact, they have a movement like this. They kind of come back like this, and they kind of cup and go forward. And they come back, and they go like that. Amazing. Now, there's trillions of those trillions. lining the whole respiratory tree. The and they're all in there beating. <laughs> and the question is, how are they going to beat? Well, what if they just all marched their own drummer? And the silly just went like this. See? Just Imagine millions, anyway. trillions. Just to, that wouldn't move the mucus. It would just right. sort of sit there. Another possibility is that they would move like window wipers in a car. They would all be sequenced somehow, so they'd all work together, left, right, left, right. That wouldn't move the mucus either. The mucus might go up and down, up and down. <laughs> the only movement that can move the mucus up the respiratory tree to get it up to the oral cavity is a special movement called a metacrinal rhythm. And there it is right there. We've kind of illustrated it. If you've seen them do the wave in the ball stadium, they get this wave sure, going. Sure, I've done the wave. Yep, that's the pattern. When wind blows across the wheat field, you see that similar pattern. Isn't it amazing? This is the only pattern 
that those millions, even trillions of cilia can beat in. They must do so in a coordinated way throughout the entire respiratory tree, and only this will bring mucus up out of the tree. Is it doing that all the time? All the time, constantly never working. Never stops moving the mucus by And people having who would that. get a inactive cilia would have Tiny significant respiratory problems. Yeah. Moving your mucus up, uphill. That's yeah, amazing. Smoking can interfere with the movement of these uh, cilia. So uh, you have a new respect for just even the air lining. Incredible. Well, when these air tubes go down into the lung, the respiratory tree branching into smaller and smaller branches, as any tree would do, uh, they finally get to the end, the twigs of the branches, and uh, on the end we have little air sacs. They're called alveoli. And this is where the oxygen will enter the blood capillaries because ultimately what we want to accomplish with the lungs is to get the oxygen out of the air into the capillaries and then get the dead air, the CO2, carbon dioxide, out of the blood into the lung to exhale. And that all happens in these little sacs called alveoli. Let's actually look at those in the microscope. This is a section right through a lung, and if you notice, it looks foamy. And the reason it looks foamy is every one of these little rings that you see here, maybe use a different color, be easier to see, every one of these little rings out here is one of these air sacs or alveoli. Uh, so this is a larger air pathway here, like a bigger twig of the tree or a bigger branch, and it branches once here, branches again here, branches again here, and there are several orders of branching as we come out until we get to the end where we have this little cluster uh, of uh, air sacs called alveoli. Let's magnify it a little bit more. Can you see the little individual rings there? Yes, sir. We'll magnify it some more yet. <laughs> I call this magnifying the Lord. <laughs> and finally, we get to a point where you can see this would be one of those air sacs, the alveolus. Now, it doesn't look like it opens anywhere, but in some other plane of section. This is a good view of one right here. They're like a bowl. They're shaped like this, and the air can come in from the bronchioles, the little twigs and branches of the respiratory tree. And uh, in the walls of all these little like air bubbles, we just have a whole network of capillaries waiting to get that oxygen to take it off to the big toe or wherever it needs to go to get the nutrients. Well, this is an interesting picture here where we've taken a piece of lung and cut a kind of a thick section through it. But before we did that, we filled the blood vessels of the lung uh, with a dye. And uh, this is one of those, uh, find a contrasting color, this is one of those little air sacs alveoli here. Here's another one here. And what I want you to notice is just how rich this plexus of capillaries are in there. And that this is what's going to pick up that oxygen, put it in the blood, and uh, get it off to all the cells in the body that require oxygen. Well, if we take an even higher power view of this little uh, uh, sac, this alveolus, uh, it's kind of scrunched together here. Uh, there are blood vessels running through here. I can see one going through like this. But in addition to the cells that cover the lung, there's another type of cell right here that looks foamy. We call that the type 2 cell. The type 1 cell lines all those little sacs in the lung. The type 2 cell secretes a little special material, looks foamy in the microscope, and that material is surfactant. It's basically similar to dishwashing detergent. Really? You <laughs> see, in order to breathe, the lung is lined with water. It's a little thin coating of water. Now, if you were to take a sandwich bag, put some water in the sandwich bag, you would notice that the two walls would cling together. Yeah. If you took two pieces of glass, imagine two window panes, put some water on it. Put the two plates together. You can't pull them apart. You have to slide them apart. That's because of the surface tension force of water when it's in a thin film. These little air sacs would collapse tight and you couldn't breathe were it not for the fact that your lung is secreting a special detergent like dish detergent that breaks down the surface tension, which is what the whole effect of, of washing detergent is, and allows the lung to stay open. 
Sometimes What's that called? Uh, that's called surfactant. Okay. And it's made by what we call a type 2 cell in the lung. You have the type 1, which gets the oxygen across. Right. The type 2 makes that. How about that? Uh, you weren't going to get through this talk today without seeing my grandson. My grandson, Hayden, was born two months premature. He only weighed about two and a half pounds when he was born. He spent about a, uh, two months of his uh, life there in neonatal intensive care. One of his problems, being born this early, is that he was not ready to make the surfactant, the detergent. So the, so, the capillaries are there to, to take the air, but the, the detergent isn't there. Right, the, the capillaries are there, producers. the lungs are there, the yes. airways there, everything's in place. Okay. The only thing you don't have is the detergent wow. that keeps these little thin filmy bags from clinging. I didn't realize that. And by making the detergent, they can open up and you can breathe. Uh -huh. So uh, they have little tricks where they kind of blow some of the detergent in and they, and they get the cells to develop a little faster. But this is a problem with premature babies, yes. is that they're not ready to make the detergent. Think of it, one little component in our life we don't even think about. Oh, no. Laundry detergent in our lungs, as it were. I didn't know that that was the problem. <laughs> That's amazing. You know, we've got to take a break, Dr. Menton. Don't you go away. We'll be back. We're going to talk about blood when we come back, so you'll want to be with us. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. The human brain, a marvel of engineering. The brain has over 10 billion nerve cells. It also sends out electrical impulses at almost 300 miles per hour and receives 2,000 responses per second. The brain constantly receives signals from light receptors in the eyes, hearing receptors from the ears, taste buds, heat sensors on the skin, cold sensors, and touch sensors. How can anybody believe this magnificent structure was not designed? Today's guest on Origins, anatomist Dr. David Menton, is a speaker for Answers in Genesis. Audiences enjoy his well-illustrated presentations on a variety of fascinating topics. Many of these lectures are available on DVD. If you're interested in the subject of creation, you'll definitely want these for your own. Orders are being taken at 800-778-3390. You can also write to Answers in Genesis, PO Box 510, Hebron, Kentucky, 41048. Or visit the website at www.answersingenesis.org. We're back and we've left Professor Menton up at the board. We've gotten the, uh, Dr. Menton, we've taken the air and it's come through our lungs and we've showed us how the lungs work. But now how do we get the oxygen that has been brought in by the, by the lungs to the, to the body? I guess it's through the blood? Absolutely. You know, in Leviticus we're told that the blood is the life. And interestingly enough, blood itself, at least in our bloodstream, red blood cells, are technically not alive. Really? And yet, they say that the only way you can really finally die is lack of blood. <laughs> Yeah. So that blood is absolutely essential for life without itself being alive when it's in the bloodstream. Of course, it was alive when it was being formed in the bone marrow, had a nucleus and what have you. Let's look at those red blood cells. They're pretty uh, uh, wonderful structures in their own right. Uh, we have two kinds of cells that go through our blood. We have the red ones, which you can see here, uh, and they're kind of uh, uh, they're really not spherical. They're shaped like a plate or a disc. And then we have other cells we call the white blood cells. Now, when we stain them and to prepare them to look in the microscope, they don't look so white. They have all different kinds of pretty colors. Uh, these cells, the white cells, uh, are involved primarily in uh, fighting disease. Uh -huh. uh, so they uh, fight different kinds of uh, contaminants that might get into our blood, bacteria, things like that. Uh, the red blood cell has the special function of having a very high affinity for oxygen so that it pulls the oxygen out of the lung into the red blood cell. Then the red blood cell circulates through the body and it has to release the oxygen. Now you think about it, blood is warm and you can't get a lot of oxygen dissolved in warm water. That's why warm water tastes flat. Hmm. So we have to get oxygen dissolved somehow in warm blood and that's done 
thanks to the red blood cell. And uh, the red blood cell has a very special shape. When we look at it in the scanning electron microscope, we can see it looks like a donut where the hole didn't quite make it through. Huh. It's called a biconcave disc. Almost like little Cheerios. Right. From the edge, it would be kind of shaped like this. Okay. like a dumbbell, but right. from the top it looks like that. It turns out that this is just the optimum shape for maximizing the surface area okay. uh, to the volume. And it's just the right diameter to just fit in a capillary. So the smallest vessels of our body are the same diameter. Now, you know, the, the ingredient in that red blood cell that's so important is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the chemical that has the high affinity for oxygen and, and binds to the oxygen to carry it to the cells of the body. There's a disease called sickle cell anemia. And the reason it's called sickle cell anemia is look at the shape of the red blood cells in sickle cell anemia. They look like a sickle. And this is due to just one little minor change in the hemoglobin. Just a, an amino acid or two that's been changed just a little bit. And it has that effect on its shape. And when it doesn't have the right shape, it doesn't carry the oxygen with the same efficiency. The hemoglobin molecule is there, but it just has a couple little changes in it. And that's enough to completely change its quality. You know, I've often thought that if the whole of evolution were reduced to just making hemoglobin, okay. without which anything that breathes wouldn't live. Nothing can breathe without hemoglobin. Let's just consider the protein hemoglobin. Uh, there are different versions of it, about 12 different versions we see in the body. And it's made up of a little over 500 little units called amino acids that have to be arranged in a sequence. And there's 20 different kinds of amino acids, and so we could let those 20 amino acids be represented by the letters A through T. That's 20 letters. Okay. And if we did that, this would be one combination that we put up here. But there's only just a few of these combinations that work out of all of the different ways they could be put together. So if evolution were trying to put it together by chance, how many different ways could we put hemoglobin together? <laughs> this many ways. Uh, give you an idea how big that number is. Consider the digits that are in yellow there. That's a four with nine zeros. No clock has ever ticked that many times. Clocks haven't been around that long. Okay. Let's add a few more zeros. We've added enough to make 52 zeros. That number would exceed the number of proteins that could have ever existed in the whole Earth uh, or the universe, no matter how many inhabited planets you'd like to invoke. Uh, let's consider a little bit bigger number. This 4 followed by 80 zeros is a number that exceeds the number of electrons that could fit in the known universe if packed tight. And every time we add a zero, the number gets 10 times bigger. Yes. And this is the total combination of ways to put hemoglobin together. And if you're going to believe in evolution, you have to dumb luck your way into one of 12 of those. Now, that, that's, that's obviously impossible. Dr. Menton, join me down here as we, as we wrap this up. I, you know, it's all in the way we look at it, isn't it? If we assume a creator who loved us and who has redeemed us, when we look in the microscope, we see things that proclaim his glory. If we are a skeptic and a doubter, we look in that same microscope and we just don't see God, do we? No, Romans chapter 1, in fact, says that everybody knows the truth that God is creator, but the unbeliever suppresses the truth and unrighteousness. When he looks at nature, he looks at hemoglobin, looks at the lung, he takes what he knows to be true, that there is a creator, and he suppresses it. He keeps it down. He sets on it. And, and that is the... Uh, formula for disaster, isn't it? Absolutely. I hope that you've learned enough today that you'll want to look in to the God of the Bible, the God who loves you so much. And as you're looking, I want you to keep one thing in mind until we meet again. You know, it's God's view that He created you, and that should be your worldview too. Hope you'll join us again here in Origins, my friend. Dr. Menton, thanks for being with us, and God bless you.
Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 810 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 810, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.